ครับแต่ there is a tradition of translating this expression coming out of English translators from Sri Lanka, Ceylon, translating this expression, this O oh monk is the only way, <laughs> or this is the sole way, S O L E, or this is the exclusive way, something in that spirit. And then this becomes <laughs> the kind of meaning by which the Theravada Buddhists then grasp upon Satipatthana and present it as their answer to the Christian evangelicals who say Jesus is the only way. <laughs> so they say the four foundations of mindfulness. That is the only way. <laughs> But The original expression "a t a i a n u m doesn't mean only. If it was the only way, it would be i a n g b i k a v e a k o v a one only m u g g l a k o v a m u g g l But a t a i a n u m m u g g l means the expression "a t a i a n u m means literally one going. And、the commentaries give different explanations of it. Some not particularly convincing. Now, the only real hint within the n i k a y a s themselves as to the meaning of this expression is a sutta called the Greater Discourse on. The lion d r a w This is the twelfth discourse in the Mati m a n i k a y a in which we find the Buddha describing his knowledge, his super knowledge of how a person could be heading for a particular mode of rebirth based on his behavior, his present behavior. And the Buddha says that. He gives similes for each of his types of knowledge, and for example, somebody who is heading for a rebirth in the hell realm, he says that just as if there were a burning charcoal pit, and a person or a person was walking along a kaino muzzle, heading straight for that charcoal pit. And somebody, a man with good sight, seeing him would know this person is walking along such a path that he will fall into that charcoal pit. Okay, so here we have the expression a k a i a n o m u g g l describing the path heading towards that charcoal pit. It doesn't mean that is the only path heading to that charcoal pit. But rather, it's a path going in one direction towards the t a r k o l p i t And so, from this passage, we can see that the expression "I k a i a n o m u g o means a path going straight to a particular destination, a path going directly to a particular destination. Or using a modern analogy, it's like a one-way street in a town. A street going only in one direction. You can't turn back, make a U-turn, and go in the other direction on that path, on that road. Okay, so now the Buddha is going to be speaking here about a path that goes in one direction. And what is that direction? It is towards the purification of being, towards the surmounting or overcoming of sorrow and lamentation. s o k a p a r i d e v a h a n a m s a m a t i k a m a y a for the passing away or extinction of pain and dejection. d u k a d o m i n a s a n a a t k a n d a m a y a Okay, so all of these here are describing what you might call experiential aspects of the practice 
of this one-way path. Then comes, we move now into what I call the super, super mundane dimension, the world transcending dimension, for the attainment of Nyaya, which means, here it's translated true way, it could also be translated the right method, and the commentary explains that this means for the attainment of the world transcending Noble Eightfold Path. And then we have for the realization of Nibbana, Nibbana Sasati Kiriyaya. And what is that one way path that's heading towards these goals? I'll use the Pali, Chitaro Satipatthana. It's the four Satipatthanas. And this word Satipatthana needs some explanation also. Okay, the word Satipatthana is what we call in Pali grammar a compound, which means it's two words joined together. And then the question comes up, what is it a compound of? What are the two words being compounded to form this compound? And I was, some of the Pali commentaries give an explanation of sati Vatana as a compound of sati, which means mindfulness, and puttana, which means basis or foundation. And so we then get a very nice sounding combination or expression in English, foundations of mindfulness. So this has become sort of the most popular way of rendering the expression satipatthana, the four foundations of mindfulness. And this has become almost standard amongst expositors of the Buddhist, Buddhist sutras. But there's a lot of evidence that this way of interpreting the compound and this way of explaining it is not correct. That it doesn't conform to the original meaning. The evidence that it doesn't conform to the original meaning comes from many sutras which use expressions like satsing upatapetva, having set up or having established mindfulness. That is when a monk is beginning to practice meditation, he sits down, he folds his legs, straightens the body, and then Sasting Upata Pesa, having established mindfulness, Paribukam Sasting Upata Pesa, having set up mindfulness before him, then he starts to practice. Or we have a description of somebody who is engaged in the practice of mindfulness as Upatita Sati, one who has established mindfulness. And so from these expressions, and there are still more along the same line, we could see that the real derivation of Satipatthana is Sati plus Upatthana. Upatthana means setting up or establishing. So therefore I translate it now the four establishments of mindfulness. And we get further confirmation of this way of interpreting the compound from the way the Sanskrit texts have presented this expression. The texts were translated from various Prakrit into Sanskrit, or what's called the Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, maybe several centuries after the time of the Buddha, two or three centuries. And the translators into Sanskrit would have had 
the tradition of explanation on which they based their rendering. And so when they translated this expression into Sanskrit, it comes out as above their smrit yupasthana. Smritya or smriti represents sati. And then we can see upasthana shows that they understood it as upatana, setting up or establishing. So what we have here are not four foundations of mindfulness in the sense of four objects but rather four ways of setting up or establishing mindfulness. So these four ways are distinguished or differentiated with reference to their objects. And so in the end, (laughs) it might not differ that much from the four foundations of mindfulness, but still there is, you could say, a difference in nuance or a difference in emphasis on whether the emphasis is on the object, which is what is implied by the four foundations of mindfulness, or in contrast, the whole process of setting up or establishing mindfulness. And I think taking it as establishing of mindfulness gives a broader meaning, since there we're bringing in not only the object, but the whole or with constellation or group of factors that is involved in a setting up mindfulness. Okay, so now this, this is the opening statement by the Buddha about the one-way path and so on, and then concluding this with the four satipatthanas, the four establishments of mindfulness. And now the Buddha is going to give a filling out of that opening statement, a completion of it, by explaining what are these four establishing establishments of mindfulness. Okay, so what are the four? Here monks, a monk twelve contemplating the body in the body, ardent, clearly comprehending and mindful, having subdued or removed longing and dejection in regard to the world. Similarly, he dwells contemplating feelings and feelings. He dwells contemplating mind in mind. He dwells contemplating phenomena in phenomena, ardent, clearly comprehending and mindful, having subdued longing and dejection in regard to the world. It's quite a lot to explain here. The first thing that might strike you when you look at these formulas is a duplicate, what seems to be a redundancy or a, du- or a duplication. For example, in the first one, he dwells contemplating the body and the body. Sounds like a very strange expression. Let me write this on the, black, on the whiteboard. What we have to do is get an electronic board. <laughs> That's yet one that can read my thoughts. <laughs> so I just have to think of the expression. <laughs> that, don't, haven't they invented that yet? <laughs> the what? The first part, yes. The electronic ones. Where I could be sitting here and... You could just be writing on your screen. Really, then we have to get one. <laughs> <laughs> can, yeah. can we program it so it will know poly? <laughs> we could run we could run my poly course through it and then it will learn all the poly grammar and stuff. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
it's useful to have this written out because we can actually see what the original text says. And it will be translated very literally. The first expression, Kaye Kayan Opashi, would be translated with Viharati. He dwells as a body contemplator in regard to the body. Then the next one, Vedanasu Vedananu Pasi Viharati. He dwells as a feeling contemplator in regard to feeling. Chitte Chitanu Pasi Viharati. He dwells as a mind contemplator in regard to mind. And then the fourth, Tamesu Dhammanu Pasi Viharati. He dwells as a Dhamma contemplator in regard to Dhammas, phenomena. Now the commentaries give some, several explanations of this replication, the duplication of expressions. The commentary says, for example, he dwells as a body contemplator in regard to the body. It explains when one is contemplating the body, one contemplates it only as a body. One doesn't contemplate it as being mine, I, myself. One doesn't contemplate it as being a person, an individual identity. But when one is contemplating the body, one suspends or puts aside, puts in brackets, all interpretations of the body as being mine, I, myself, a person, a being, a man, a woman, and focuses upon the body simply as a body, the body that's experienced as such. Another explanation the commentary gives is that when one is contemplating one object of mindfulness, one doesn't mingle it or mix it with other objects of mindfulness. That is, when one is contemplating the body, then one doesn't contemplate feeling, one doesn't contemplate mind one doesn't contemplate the mental object, but one sort of separates each of these four bases or foundations of mindfulness, and one focuses exclusively on that foundation of mindfulness, not bringing in the other foundations, the other objects of mindfulness. And so those are two explanations given in the commentary. It struck me recently, <laughs> again, that I have to label this my personal understanding, not authorized by tradition, <laughs> that this duplication might simply be a peculiar style of expression in Pali that might not have any more particular significant. Sometimes one finds in Pali that a verb and an object, a sentence will use a verb which relates to an object. which both suggest the same idea, both the verb and the object suggest the same idea. For example, when in Pali, when we say that one clings to something, for example, one clings to views, they will say one clings to views through a clinging to views. So instead of saying simply one clings to views, one has to say one clings to views through a clinging to views, which to us sounds redundant. But that is just the style of expression in Pali. 
So it struck me that this might be a case similar to that, where it's just a way of saying, a rather complicated way of saying that one dwells contemplating the body, one dwells contemplating the feeling, <laughs> one dwells contemplating mind, one dwells contemplating mental objects. So maybe we don't have to read any special significance into the duplication. I'm not sure about that. Okay, anyway, we begin with specifying what are the objects of this contemplation, and then we have that special, at the point, we have the special word anupasi here, which is translated contemplation. Now, the derivation of this is interesting and important. Anupasi comes from the verb pasati, which means to see. And then the prefix anu suggests the idea of repetition. Repetition and also the idea of consistency or continuity. So when one practices anupasi, when one practices kayanupasi, what we call contemplation of the body, it means repeatedly or continuously seeing the body. We might even translate this observation when practices the observation of the body, the observation of feeling, the observation of the state of mind, the observation of Dhamma's phenomena. And so this is a close, repeated, consistent, continuous perception of the object. And then what are the factors that are involved in this close observation of the object? These factors are what are being specified in the rest of the sentence. So he dwells, contemplating the body and the body, atapi sampajano satima, ardent, clearly comprehending, and mindful. Tineya loke abhicha dominasan having subdued longing and dejection in regard to the world. Here we have three words, or three words, ardent, clearly comprehending, and mindful, which is pointing to three distinct factors or aspects of this process of contemplation. First, this word ardent, atapi, according to the Kapapidamba, the commentaries, other texts, this implies the presence of energy or effort, making the right effort. Then clearly comprehending sampajano, this implies the presence of some degree of understanding, knowing clearly. being aware, fully aware, or maybe I'll avoid this use of awareness, which is rather vague, but knowing clearly, knowing precisely what one is doing. And then comes mindful. Mindful is in a way the key word to this whole process of development, which is why it's called the four establishments of mindfulness. And yet when we speak about establishments of mindfulness, we have to take, this is why I prefer establishments to foundations of mindfulness. Because what's being specified is not only the object, but the whole process of setting up mindfulness. And that whole process involves contemplating or observing the object, doing so ardently, 
that is with energy, with effort, clearly comprehending the object, knowing the object, honing, homing in on the object, and understanding it in the act of observation. And then comes being mindful. Here, the word, the operative word is sati ma, having mindfulness. Okay, the word sati ma means having mindfulness, and so the stem of that word is sati, which in Sanskrit is smriti. And the word sati, originally in Indian languages, meant remembrance or memory. It comes from the verb sarati, which means to remember. And so sometimes we find the word sati used in the Pali text in reference to memory of the past. For example, it says that somebody who has sati remembers what was said and done a long time ago. But the Buddha took this word sati out of everyday usage, the kind of word that he pulled up from its everyday usage, and then he gave it a special meaning within the context of his own teaching. And within the context of his own teaching, sati means remembrance not of the past, but of the present moment. Well, we can say that it means bringing to mind what is occurring in the present moment. So what happens when we remember something? For example, I think of something that I did yesterday. What I do is somehow to pluck out of the storage of my subconscious. I pluck something out and I bring it to mind. I bring it in front, to the forefront of my attention. And so what one is doing in the practice of mindfulness is continually bringing a particular object to the forefront of one's awareness, bringing it to the forefront of one's attention, keeping a particular object continuously in mind, not forgetting that object. And if one from time to time forgets it, then one remembers to bring that object back to the mind, back to the forefront of one's attention. And then one makes the effort to keep it there, to sustain a continuous awareness of the object. Okay, and so the establishment of mindfulness involves the close and continuous observation of the object, and that observation takes place energetically, diligently, as expressed by the word ardent. It is occurring not in a kind of dull stupor, but with a clear comprehension, a clear knowing of the object and of what one is doing. And then what preserves the object in front of one's post of observation, or what ties the object to one's post of observation, what preserves the presence of the object in the forefront of one's attention is mindfulness. Now, the attempt to keep the object present before one's mind 
In other words, the attempt to remain continuously mindful of the object is subject to strong attacks from different quarters. And the primary enemies, the primary obstructions to the continuity of mindfulness come from two quarters. One is longing, what's called longing. The other is dejection in regard to the world. Here, longing, abhita, is craving, grasping, desire. And then dejection is a dis- disappointment, sadness, sorrowful memories, discouragement. It also includes um, ill will. And so the commentaries say that when the text refers to longing and dejection here, it's actually indicating the first two of the five hindrances. So there's some question about this. We find that longing, abhita, is often used in the text as a substitute for the first hindrance, kama chanda, sensual desire. We don't find the word dejection, dominasa, used as a substitute for ill will. But that is the way the commentary explains it. And so the commentary says, when the first two of the five hindrances are mentioned, it actually implies that all five hindrances are, are intended. But even if we don't accept that explanation from the commentary, we could just simply see the text as indicating the two most obstructive enemies of the attempt to maintain mindfulness of the object. The two destructive enemies are craving. One has craving for objects of desire, especially sensual desire. And then one has dejection, feelings of disappointment, sorrow, regret, involving things that occur in one worldly life. And so, in order to practice mindfulness, to practice this establishment of mindfulness, one has to subdue longing and dejection in regard to the world. It doesn't mean that in order to begin the practice of mindfulness, one has to overcome longing and dejection. So we could say that the practice of developing the foundations of mindfulness is itself the process by which one subdues longing and dejection in regard to the world. Okay, so this formula is repeated to in relation to each of the four objects of mindfulness, body, feeling, mind, and dhammas or phenomena. And so we can say that what is meant by a satipatthana, an establishment of mindfulness, is not merely the object itself, but it is this whole process of setting up mindfulness by contemplating the object in itself, not mixing that contemplation with other things, contemplating the object closely and continuously, doing so with energy, with ardently, doing it with a clear comprehension, a clear knowing of the object, being mindful of the object, having that object present before one's awareness, And then, in this process of observing the object, one is putting away, removing, subduing, craving, 
and dejection arisen from worldly experience. Okay, maybe at this point I will ask whether there's any questions on any of the material that I've covered so far. Yes, Father. You refer to the commentary. What are the commentaries? Okay. I'm asking about the commentary. Okay. To refer to the commentary. Yeah, there are all commentaries on each of the Nikayas, which are attributed to an Indian state scholar or sage who had come to Sri Lanka and worked in Sri Lanka. His name is Buddha Gosa. And so for each of the Nikayas, each of the Nikayas has, in fact, each of the parts of the Tripitaka has its commentary. These commentaries, though they are ascribed to Buddha Gosa as the author, actually Buddha Gosa came to Sri Lanka from India because there were commentaries, earlier commentaries that had been preserved in Sri Lanka, which had probably accumulated over centuries. Probably they go back in their origin, maybe to the time of the Buddha, giving simple word explanations, and as they evolved from, gen- or as they would pass from generation to generation, other practitioners, Dharma masters added to them, sometimes giving more elaborate explanations, bringing in stories, till pretty much they were closed in the second century of the Common Era, and then preserved in Sri Lanka in the singular language, the old singular language called Hela. And so then Buddha Gosa was sent by the Sangha in India to Sri Lanka in order to translate these commentaries from Hela into Pali. And what he did was not simply to translate them, but it seems that the old commentaries were quite massive, so he streamlined them, cut them down, and then preserved these rather compact commentaries to each of the titles. I think maybe this question sort of jumps ahead to the expository section. So let us just put that question aside since I want to come into... I want the question now just to focus upon the introductory passage. Later I'm going to come into the expository section. I don't want to seem elusive or evasive, but also let us suspend the next question till we come work through the expository section. Otherwise, I might be jumping ahead of myself. I just want to know if there's any questions on what that covers within this introductory section. Okay. 
Okay, let us say this, being mindful of, again, this might be jumping to the expository section, but I'll deal with it just briefly. Okay, even though the longing could refer to something that takes place in the future, and dejection will refer to something that might have occurred in the past, um, what one has to do is to subdue or overcome the longing and dejection that have arisen in the present, even though their objects might be future and past, but they occur as present events. And so part of the process of subduing them is bringing the mind to a present object. For example, the breath or some aspect of the body, and then just letting letting go of the longing and the dejection. Is there a lot of Is there one? order like you are mindful of the body person and then you are mindful of the body person. Is there an order? Yes. Okay. Okay, this is a useful question. The text always presents the four foundations of mindfulness in a particular order, as we find here, going from body to feeling to states of mind and then dhammas, which are considered to be particular, usually particular mental factors. So I think that they're presented in this order in order to go from what is the coarser or grosser or more evident object to the more subtle object. This doesn't imply that one necessarily must practice the four foundations of mindfulness in this order. That seems to be, we call this the general process, or the general prescription, is to begin with a coarser object, like the body, and then as one practices with the body, this makes one more sensitive, it makes one's mindfulness sharper, clearer, and then one could focus in on the progressively more subtle objects. So that is the rationale underlying the sequence. But the Buddhist texts recognize a great diversity of personality types, individual types, personality types. And so it says that if a person, by reason of their temperament, is more inclined to another object, then one can begin with that particular object with which one naturally gravitates but eventually one should cover all four objects of mindfulness. Wait, you use the, um, the microphone. That Yeah, that is the way the commentary explains it. Um, and I, there's definitely distinctions between these objects. They're not, we said there's an overlap, or we can't say that they're identical. But um, what I would say is that when one is observing a particular object, it will make one more sensitive to the other object. And in regard to mind, as we'll see, I have to say the way the contemplation of mind is presented in order to understand the particular state of mind, because mind or consciousness itself is something very general. So in order to home in on a particular state of mind, one has to do it by way of its associated mental factors. But we'll see this later when we come to the contemplation of mind. Okay, I want to move on now. And start with the contemplation of the body. 
as I mentioned just now in response to that question, it seems that the Buddha has taken the body, kaya, as the first object of mindfulness, because the body is the grossest, the coarsest of the four objects of mindfulness, and therefore it's the most, the easiest to observe, the easiest to focus in on. And within the section of contemplation of the body, we have, according to the traditional way of counting, 14 objects of mindfulness, or 14 distinct contemplations. These 14 are derived, so first we have the mindfulness of breathing, then the four postures, then clear comprehension, then we have the unattractive nature of the body, then we have the analysis of the body into the four elements, and then we have what are called the nine charnel ground contemplations. Nine cemetery contemplation. But it seems to me, again this is my personal opinion, that the distinction of the channel ground contemplations into nine different exercises is a little bit artificial. And that we could really group them all together into one category. And in this way we would get a simpler presentation of six types of contemplation of the body, or six domains of contemplation relating to the body. Now, in the Pali version of the Satipatthana Sutta, we begin with mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati. But there are versions of this Satipatthana Sutta, which has come down in the Chinese Tripitaka, translated from other early Buddhist schools, and in at least two of those versions, the contemplation of the body begins not with mindfulness of breathing, but with the four postures, observation of the four postures. Then it moves to the clear comprehension of the activities. And then, in the third place, we have mindfulness of breathing. And it seems to me, and some others have also contended this, that this seems to be a more reasonable way of presenting the contemplation of the body in that one is beginning with something coarser with one's activities in day-to-day life and then moving from there to a subtle, more subtle practice which is a practice that takes place in the sitting posture that is the mindfulness of breathing and so in the process of developing mindfulness, one would be mindful when walking, sitting, when walking, standing, sitting and lying down, then one applies clear comprehension when involved in one's day-to-day activities, and then after one has developed mindfulness and clear comprehension to some extent in these grosser activities, then one is considered ready to sit down and begin a meditation practice which develops a more intensified mindfulness through attention to a single, simple object. But it could be the case that the compilers of the Pali Suttas move mindfulness of breathing to the first position for a particular reason. And this could give some justification for taking mindfulness of breathing first. And this would be the reason, the way I would understand it. One begins with mindfulness of breathing 
Because in order to apply mindfulness effectively in everyday life, one has, needs to have some experience of what it means to be mindful. And if one says simply, be mindful when walking, be mindful when standing, be mindful when sitting down, apply clear comprehension when walking forward and coming back, when bending and stretching and so on. A young practitioner, a new practitioner, doesn't really have a clear idea of what is expected of him. But when one starts to practice, with mindfulness of breathing, then one begins to understand what does it mean to be mindful, to keep an object steadily in the forefront of attention? What does it mean to know an object close up and consistently in order to be able to practice clear comprehension in everyday life? And so, for example, in a monastic situation, a young, you have a young newly ordained monk, and so the basis for the monastic life is the practice of meditation. And so he'll be taught initially a basic meditation practice, mindfulness of breathing. And then this will be the practice that he undertakes in the hours that are reserved for meditation. And then through this practice of mindfulness of breathing, then he is becoming acquainted with the meaning of mindfulness, the experience of mindfulness, what we can call the experiential taste of mindfulness. And so, and then also, he'll be challenged to develop this clear comprehension to know an object, even if it's a very simple object, like the breath. And so on this basis, and this, so through the practice of mindfulness of breathing, he will be developing mindfulness and clear knowing. And then when he emerges from meditation, and then has to move about, going here and there, he'll be able to extend or continue that observation that's involved in developing mindfulness, that self-observation, keeping one's bodily actions, one's state of mind, keeping them under observation. And so in that way, he will be able to practice more effectively mindfulness and clear comprehension with regard to the four postures and with regard to the activities of everyday life. <coughs> Okay, so this deals with this order and sequence of the initial meditation object. Okay, then it seems to me, again, this is my personal opinion, that here mindfulness of breathing is being used as a foundation meditation object in order to develop this quality of mindfulness and clear comprehension with which one can then proceed further into the other exercises included in mindfulness of the body or contemplation of the body. So, one uses the mindfulness of breathing as a basic meditation object. And then for those... Now, mindfulness of breathing can be extended all the way through all four foundations of mindfulness and by itself it forms a self-sufficient vehicle for going all the way to the highest enlightenment to what's called Vita Vibhuti full knowledge and liberation So within the framework of this Satipatthana Sutta this very broad comprehensive comprehensive approach to the development of mindfulness. It seems that one uses the mindfulness of breathing to develop the qualities of mindfulness and clear comprehension. And then when those qualities are brought up and developed to some extent, 
then one can move into the other exercises the examination of the body in order to dissect it into its constituent parts that's the exercise for the unattractive nature of the body and then one can move the mindfulness further into the dissection or analysis of the body into its constituent elements the four material elements and then one moves further into the nine cemetery meditations in order to get a clear idea or a clear experience or perception of the impermanence of the body its eventual decay, disintegration and decay now all of this is taking place is the way I see it enfolded within this envelope of mindfulness of breathing which is the basic exercise okay and so here we can go directly into the section of mindfulness of breathing now in the full sati I'm sorry the full anapana sati sutta that's the discourse on mindfulness of breathing and in the section of the Sangyutta Nikaya on mindfulness of breathing the Buddha explains Satipatthana in terms of 16 steps or 16 aspects and those 16 aspects are divided into four groups of the 16 four steps are included within each of the four groups and those four groups correspond to the four establishments of mindfulness the four setting up of four old setting up of mindfulness and so the practice of mindfulness of breathing extends over all four, four foundations of mindfulness all four satipatthana And we will come to this later when we come to the Anapana Sati Sutta, which I've included here. I've included here the section on mindful, mindfulness of breathing. But in the Sati Patana Sutta, the Buddha presents under mindfulness of breathing, he includes only the four exercises, the first four exercises. From the, sati, from the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, from the Anapanasati Sutta. Okay, so now we begin here in paragraph 4, page 282. How does a monk dwell contemplating the body and the body? And now he's going to explain this first with regard to mindfulness of breathing. So here a monk gone to the forest, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty hut, He's mentioned the ideal places for developing mindfulness of breathing. He sits down, having folded his legs crosswise, having straightened out the body, and having established mindfulness in front of him. Parimukkam satsing upatapetva. Here we get that expression as having established which is also the same word that goes into satipatthana, sati upatthana, the establishment of mindfulness. Okay then, satova asasati, satova asasati, just mindful he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. Okay, in this one sentence, sees us to the entire practice of mindfulness of breathing. And we get here, interestingly, it's satova. Yeah, this word satova, it's an abridgment of sato eva. This little particle, the or eva here, is extremely important because it underscores 
the fact that the essence of the practice is having this mindfulness always present, continuously present, as one is breathing in and as one is breathing out. And so I say the essence of the whole process of mindfulness of breathing is compressed into this one sentence, being simply mindful while breathing in, being simply mindful while breathing out or being ever mindful, continuously mindful while breathing in, continuously mindful while breathing out. And so the whole process of mindfulness of breathing unfolds from that exercise, that intention of constantly and continuously being mindful of the breath as one breathes in and as one breathes out. And then the important question comes up when one breathes in and out, where is one's mindfulness to be established? Where is it to be directed? And here there's a very significant difference between the explanation of mindfulness of breathing given within the Pali or Theravada tradition and the explanation given within texts of the northern tradition stemming from the Abhidharma Kosha. According to texts like the Abhidharma Kosha, which has been the basis for the practice of mindfulness of breathing, in Chinese Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, when one breathes in, one follows the breath from the place where it originates, the nostrils, or the tip of the nose, then through the nostrils, then down into the lungs, or even down to the belly, and then one follows the out-breath from the place where it originates, the belly or the lungs, out through the nostril, then out through the tip of the nose. And so one is following the breath in its movement through the body. The way I see it, and also I mean the way some of the other Theravadan teachers see it, if one is following the breath in its movement through the body, it will be very difficult to develop jhana on the basis of the breathing, to develop the mental fixation or the absorption, because one is following the breath in different places. The teachers in the Pali tradition, going back to a work called Patisambhita Magha, say that when observing the breath, the focal point should always be the area at the nostril, around the nostril, or the upper lip, where one can experience the sensation of the breath, the feeling of the breath as it comes in and out. And to illustrate the way the attention should be focused at that one point, well, first they compare the mindfulness there to a guard who is guarding the door of a building. And when the guard is at the entrance to the building, the guard will be aware any people come in. He opens the door and so they come in. Any people come out of the building, he's aware of the people coming in, going out of the building. But the guard, if he's doing his duty properly, <laughs> when somebody comes in, he doesn't follow that person into the building, onto the elevator, up to the third, fourth floor. <laughs> and when somebody is going out, he doesn't follow them into their taxi and drive away with them. <laughs> but the guard just remains at the door, checking people as they come out, 
uh, checking people as they come in, when they come out, maybe hailing a taxi for them, but letting the people coming in and going out go about their own business without following them. And so, analogously, the mindfulness is the guard at the entrance to the breathing passages. That is, it's set up, the mindfulness is set up at the nostrils, around the nostrils, just beneath the nostrils on the upper lip, wherever one experiences the breath coming in and going out. Again, this is compared to a man who is sawing a block of wood, a log. He has the saw in his hand, there's a block of wood laid out, on, maybe on the table in front of him, and he takes the saw and he saws back and forth. But where is his attention fixed as he's sawing the block of wood? The attention is fixed on that point where the teeth of the saw strike against the wood and cut through the wood. He doesn't follow the saw as it moves away from him. He doesn't follow the teeth of the saw as they move closer to him. But in order to be able to cut the block of wood effectively, he just keeps his attention on that one area where the teeth of the saw are cutting through the block of wood. And so one keeps the attention focused on this area at the nostrils, around the nostrils, just below the nostrils. And one lets the in-breath come in, one lets the out-breath go out, but one doesn't follow the in-breath into the body and through the body, and one doesn't follow the out-breath out into the atmosphere, but the attention is always fixed on that particular place where one can experience the impact of the breath. In the old language, this is called the nimitta. Not in the sense of the later language, nimitta as the radiant ball of light, but simply it is the object where one experiences the in and out breath. In the older Pali language, the nimitta means simply the object of attention, the object of awareness. It doesn't yet have that special meaning of that visualized light, point of light, or ball of light, but it's simply the place of attention, the place of awareness. And so for Anapanasati, according to the teachers of the Southern tradition, the place, the nimitta or place of awareness, place of attention, is this area around the nostrils. And it is there that one observes the breath as it comes in, as it goes out. And so now, from that introductory point, then we come to four ways of observing the breath that are mentioned. These are the four that constitute the first of the of the, the first four of the sixteen steps of mindfulness of breathing in the sati in the Anapanasati Sutta. Okay, when one breathes in long, then one understands or one knows I breathe in long. That is the first. When breathing in, actually the first is when breathing in long, one understands I breathe in long. And when breathing out long, one understands I breathe out long. And now we have here an important word that's translated one understands, it's pajanati. 
This word Pajanati this verb Pajanati is the basis for the noun Panya or Sanskrit Pajna which is usually translated as wisdom. But at this point in the practice of mindfulness of breathing there is no wisdom in the sense of a higher knowledge a deeper understanding. But this is simply being aware of the breath, knowing when breathing in long that the breath is long, knowing when breathing out long that the breath, out breath is long. And so it seems to me that here the verb pajanati is more closely connected with the word sampajana which is what we translate clear comprehension. So this is the element of clear comprehension involved in mindfulness of breathing. That is, when breathing in long, knowing, understanding, comprehending that the breath is long. When breathing out long, comprehending, understanding that the breath is long. And so sometimes the question comes up in being aware of the breath, what is the relationship of mindfulness and clear and clear comprehension? The way I would understand it, and again this is my personal opinion, I haven't seen this discussed in the text themselves. So the way I would understand it, mindfulness is that particular mental factor that keeps the object, in this case the breath, continuously present before the mind. Mindfulness is remembering to be aware of the object. We could say mindfulness is retaining the object in mind not letting the object slip away and if the object slips away then bringing the object back to the mind that is the function of mindfulness okay so mindfulness is what keeps the object present to the mind that is keeping the in-breath and out-breath present to the mind then the function of clear comprehension is to know first when breathing in that one is breathing in when breathing out to know that one is breathing out and then making that attention more refined when breathing in long knowing that the breath is long when breathing out long knowing that the breath out that the out breath is long so that is the job, the task, the function of clear comprehension. Okay, then the same thing is repeated with regard to the short breath. When breathing in short, one understands I breathe in short. When breathing out short, he understands I breathe out short. It strikes me a, a little bit, as a little bit puzzling that the long breath is presented before the short breath. Since it seems to me, I mean, not only to me, but everybody has this experience, that when one sits down to begin the exercise of being mindful of the breath, initially the breath is longer because it's coarser. And then as, I'm sorry, as one, no, when one starts to breathe, I, I lost my mind for <laughs> When one starts to be aware of breathing in and out, initially the breath is shorter or quicker because the mind is still excited or agitated. But as the mind settles down and one becomes more aware of the breath, then the breath becomes subtler and quieter 
and then the breath becomes longer. So this is a little bit puzzling. The way I would interpret this now, the long breath should be understood to be the coarser breath, and then the short breath should be understood to be the subtle breath. So in breathing in long, one is aware of breathing in long, that means when taking a coarse breath, one is aware that one is taking a coarse breath. When the breath becomes quieter and subtler, then one is aware that one is taking in, breathing out with a subtler, quieter breath. Okay, so these two are the first two stages of steps in mindfulness of breathing. And sometimes they could alternate. Sometimes one can be breathing very, have a very quiet, very subtle breath. Then suddenly maybe some disturbance comes into the mind and then the breath will become longer or coarser again. So whatever the breath is, long or, long or short, coarse or subtle, one understands the breath as it is. And then as one is knowing the breath, following the breath, gradually over time the breath becomes subtler and subtler, quieter and quieter, moving in a direction towards the complete stopping of the in and out breath, which takes place in the fourth jhana. Okay, now we come to the third step in the mindfulness of breathing. And notice there's a change in the verb here. He trains thus, I will breathe in, experiencing the whole body. He trains thus, I will breathe out, experiencing the whole body. Here we have the change in verb from simply knowing to sikati. Avan Sikati. He trains thus. Which means that this third, when one reaches this third step, one is now making a more deliberate effort. And this more deliberate effort is expre- expressed as experiencing the whole body when breathing in, when breathing out. Sabakaya Pati Sambedi. Asasati. Sabakaya Pati Sambedi. Pasasi Samiti Sikati. Okay, what is meant here by experiencing the whole body? First I will give the traditional commentarial explanation. This is the standard Theravada explanation. It is said that the breath itself is to be considered a body. You call this the whole body of breath. And so to experience the whole body means to be aware of the entire cycle of in and out breathing. And so the cycle of in and out breathing is divided into the two stages, two primary stages of in-breath and out-breath. And then each of these two stages has three phases. The in-breath has the beginning, then it has the middle, and it has the end. Then the out-breath has its beginning, its middle, its end. And so, when one undertakes this training, I will breathe in experiencing the whole body. What one does is make the determination to be aware of the entire in-breath from its very beginning all the way through its entire duration, not letting the mind stray or wander or lose track, not letting the mind lose track of the in-breath. 
till one comes to the very end of the in-breath. Then the breathing turns around with the beginning of the out-breath, and again one has to make the determination to be fully aware of this out-breath from its the moment of its beginning all the way through its duration till its very end. Then when one reaches the end of the out-breath, again one establishes the mindfulness on the in-breath from its beginning through its middle to its end, then again with the out beginning, middle, and end. And this act of determination establishes the continuity of mindfulness so that the mindfulness doesn't wander away from the object. And now one is able to observe the in-breath, out-breath, always with the attention in the same place around the nostrils, in the nostrils, around the nostrils, wherever one experiences the breath most distinctly. But now one is following the whole course of the breath without losing track of it, without the mind wandering. Okay, that is the standard traditional interpretation. It seems to me this is my heretical opinion, or my variant opinion. I just find it difficult to understand this expression, whole body, in terms of that explanation. It seems to me that whole body has to be taken as literally true. And also the word patisambhedi, which in Pali, it conveys the flavor of experiencing, not being aware or being attentive to, but experiencing. So my understanding here is that as one is being mindful of the breath, one is keeping the attention at the nostrils, not following it in other places, but as the awareness of the breath increases, becomes more focused, more subtle, more sensitive, then one is able to experience the whole body. And so one is experiencing the whole body, one has a kind of, I'll call it a background awareness of the whole body. while the focus of the attention remains at the nostrils. If it seems to me, again this is interpretation, that this stage of being experiencing the whole body while breathing in and out is referring to the process building up to the attainment of jhana based to the meditative absorption based on in and out breathing. Because it said that when one attains the jhana in the formula for the jhanas which we had earlier this is actually in the passage with the similes page 251. We have, he enters and dwells, paragraph 15 on page 251. He enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thought and examination with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. He makes the rapture and happiness born of seclusion drenched feet still and pervades his body so that there is no part of his whole body that is not pervaded by the rapture and happiness born of seclusion. Okay, then we have this reference to this experience of the whole body in relation to each of the other dhammas in paragraph 16, paragraph 17, paragraph 18. So, as one enters the jhana, 
then whatever factors are present, rapture and happiness and so on, are felt as pervading the whole body. So we can see that experiencing the whole body while breathing in and out to be referring to the experience of the body within the jhana. And now as one passes through the stages of jhana, then the breathing becomes subtler and subtler. The breathing is what is referred to here as kaya sankara, the bodily formation. And so as one is being continuously mindful of the breath while breathing in and out, one is, the breathing itself is becoming quieter and quieter, subtler and subtler. And so that is what is being indicated by this phrase, I will breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation. I will breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. Actually, again, this is the way I understand it, one doesn't make a deliberate, intentional effort to tranquilize the breath. One simply makes the attention, the effort, the intention to be aware of the breath. But as the awareness of the breath becomes more continuous, becomes more better sustained, the breathing naturally settles down and becomes more subtle, more tranquil. And then that is what is being indicated by the tranquilizing of the bodily formation. Okay, then to indicate how the breath is to be observed, the Buddha uses a simile. This is like a lathe worker who is molding an object on a lathe. When he's making a long turn with the object, then he's aware, he understands, I'm making a long turn. When he's making a short turn with his object, he's aware, I'm making a short turn. And so it's in the same way when one is breathing in long, one knows I breathe in long. When breathing out long, one knows I breathe out long, all the way through the whole passage is repeated. Okay, maybe I'll ask at this point whether there's any questions on the mindfulness of breathing. Yes, please. You can use the microphone. Oh, through the whole body. Yeah. Um, the breathing, the breathing, the experience, the whole body experience, the, the breath from the nose out, it goes through the whole body, or the air goes through the whole body? No, yeah. How do I explain it? The way I would understand it, also the way the teachers within the Theravada tradition explained it, one doesn't follow the breath in through the body from the nostrils to the lungs, or some say to the diaphragm, and one doesn't follow the breath out from the diaphragm to the end of the nostrils. The attention always remains at the nostrils, or around the nostrils. Wherever one feels the breath coming in and out. But, as one As the mindfulness of the breath becomes subtler and more, let us say, becomes subtler, more continuous, more sustained, better sustained, then one can experience the whole body. I call this a background experience of the whole body. So that in the forefront of the, of the attention, is the nimitta, the object, which is the impact of the breath 
around the nostrils. And so one always keeps the attention on that forefront object, the impact of the breath coming in and out. But it's just a natural part of the expansion of the awareness that one will be experiencing the whole body as one is breathing in and out. So one should not follow the breath in through the body or follow it out from the inside of the body out through the nostrils. But always the attention is simply kept around the nostrils wherever one feels the breath most distinctly coming in and going out. Flip a coin between you. Okay, we'll start with... My interpretation of the whole body experience of the breathing and the breathing out, and maybe it's just my experience, <laughs> is that um, even with the starting, the only thing that we're able to do is coming into my mouth is going to the three parts in and the three parts out. Yeah. The awareness expands to the, the fulfillment of the oxygen in my body the fulfillment of the whole experience of the breathing in yep. my body and out of my body. And um, to me that's the whole body experience and that's just my interpretation. Okay, yeah, okay. What I say is that as one is aware of the in-breath, out-breath, <coughs> with the observation at the post of awareness, one experiences the body, what I call, more panoramically, let's say. So when one says that one experiences the oxygen coming in and out, you have to remember, so this is a scientific fact, but it's an interpretation, <laughs> since one doesn't actually, well, the body doesn't actually know that this is oxygen, so one can experience well, one does experience a kind of uplifting of the body, which is the result of the oxygen going through. But if one starts putting explanations on it, this is the oxygen coming through, then one is departing from the pure awareness of the breath. Um, I guess to kind of expand on that, um, from my experience, I've always found it helpful to start out with uh, the whole process of, and that helps me to just kind of settle the mind, and then mm-hmm. I would normally focus on one point that I didn't miss that. But my real question is, is the image just in relation to the nostrils, or is that just anything that's a focus of concentration? Okay, let me just take the fir- first two points in order. Because the first point that you brought up is actually a, a good point. And when I explain mindfulness of breathing, especially to beginners, what I say is, first, I don't even mention the breath first, but I say first be aware as you're sitting there after telling them how to take the posture. First be aware of the whole body. Just get a sense, a kind of tactile sense, of the body as an entity sitting in a particular posture, occupying space. Because normally, we just conceptualize our bodies, but we don't have what I call this tactile sense of the concrete reality of the body. And so, even for a few minutes, just sit there being aware of the body as a material entity. Even material is interpretation. Just get this tactile sense of the rea- concrete reality of the body. Then for a few minutes, sit there like that. Then. I say, now be aware that the body is breathing in and out. You just get a tactile sense of the whole breath as you're breathing in and out. Expansion of the lungs, contraction of the lungs, swelling out of the belly, falling of the belly. Then after the person is doing that for a few minutes, then I say, now bring your attention to the area of the nostrils. So this is a good way to go about it. Because um, 
if one just tells a person or we just try to go immediately to the nostrils it's a very subtle object easy for the mind to slip away but one sort of hones in from what is evident grosser the sense of the whole body then moving into what's subtler the tactile the sensation of the breath coming in and going out okay that was the first point <laughs> then the second point <laughs> Oh, the, okay, the meaning of the word nimitta. The way the word is used in the oldest, in the oldest text, the, the suttas themselves, it seems to mean simply the object of concentration. It doesn't necessarily mean the object of mindfulness of breathing. But just in regard to mindfulness of breathing, the proper nimitta is that area around the nostrils where one is experiencing the in and out breath. And when lying down, the navel? Yes, sir, that's what I've heard. When lying down? Yes, when lying down in concentration, to focus on the navel, rising and falling? This I haven't heard connected with lying down, but there is instruction for a method of practice this is the practice which was taught by the great Burmese Soyot, the meditation master Mahasi Soyador, and it's often used by teachers in the Burmese lineage, which is the initial object of mindfulness is the rising and falling of the abdomen. And so when, when the abdomen is, as you breathe in and out, the abdomen rises and falls. And so the teachers say, when the abdomen rises, simply be aware of rising, rising, making a mental note. When the abdomen is falling, be aware of it and make the mental note falling and falling. Now, strictly speaking, that is not the mindfulness of breathing object. But that is said to be it's a method of practice which is connected with insight meditation, dry insight meditation which is different from mindfulness of breathing. So the in and out movement of the abdomen, it's, you could say, it's rooted in the breath. It's caused by the breathing. But when one is attending to the rising and falling of the abdomen, it's not attending to the in and out breath, but it's attending to a bodily process which is conditioned by or caused by the breathing. And so the attention to the rise and fall movement of the abdomen moves in a different direction from the straight mindfulness of breathing. It's not moving towards increased concentration, but it's moving towards the direct development of insight. Okay, maybe I'll take one more question and then you have to pause for lunch. I thought the minister could be explained as a result this is the meaning of Nimitta which appears over time in later texts like the commentaries. This is the Nimitta as a, a bright light which will appear say, as one is attending to the breath, as the mind becomes very quiet, then a point of light, sometimes a ball of light will appear. And then this becomes known as the Nimitta, or more specifically the Pati Bhaga Nimitta, the counterpart sign. But I'm referring to the way the word Nimitta is used in the earlier text, where it's simply the object that one attends to as the basis for concentration. Okay, we'll have to stop now and I will go for lunch, then I will come back, and also if you want you can go to the cafeteria for the lunch or you can just stay if you don't want to take lunch now but I'll come back as early as possible but we'll start the discussion at 12 o'clock and continue for about a half an hour okay so now we'll end with the sharing of the merit and it seems my self-assigned goal of explaining the Satipatthana Sutra in two sessions <laughs> has been shattered. <laughs> we'll aim for three, so it might go for four. 
Okay, so we end with the sharing of the mirror, with the devas, the deities, the naga spirit, the fear spirit, guardian spirit, asking us to rejoice in these merits and protect the Dhamma, to protect the world, to protect ourselves and others. Akasa ta sabuma ta deva nada mahitika punyanta nanumo vipa tiram rakantu sasana akasa ta sabuma ta deva nada mahitika punyanta nanumo vipa tiram rakantu desana Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyanta nanumo vipa tiram rakantu mang parang he ta vata ta am he sampadang punya sampadang sabe deva nanumo dantu ashwatna sabe bhutanumo dantu Sabe satanumo dantu, sabha sampati siddhya. Baba rupa daya, avici hetato. He tantare satakai upapanna. Rupi arupita, asanya sanino. Tuka pavutantu, pusantu. Do legal things.